From the Toronto Star, I'm Roger Mudler, and this matters. Offshore tax havens and shell companies. These are the lifestyles of the rich and famous. In what is being called the largest collaborative journalism project in history, 600 journalists from around the world have published their findings from the Pandora Papers, an incredibly large trove of documents that paints a picture of the financial dealings of the ultra-rich and how they hide and move money around the world. It is fascinating on a number of levels, including that many of these actions are perfectly legal in our financial world. And maybe some of you out there don't think that tax evasion is that bad a thing, but there are some real costs to society. Robert Cribb and Marco Ovid are investigative reporters at The Star. As part of their collaboration with the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, they have published some recent findings from the Pandora Papers. They join us now to tell us what has been uncovered. Thank you both so much for making the time today, gentlemen. Well, thanks for having us. It's good to be here, man. Okay, guys, let's start off the top. And I know we're going to sort of delve a lot further deeper into this, but from a very high level, what are the Pandora Papers and what do they show? Rob, we'll start with you first. Well, it's a massive dump of documents. It's almost 12 million documents dumped to the International Consortium, which works with journalists around the world. No individual media organization could possibly, as you can imagine, handle something like that. So this is a sort of methodology where they bring in partners around the world. We each take a slice, focus typically on our own countries, and we go through it. So we don't know the source. We have absolutely no idea who the whistleblower is who provided these documents, as has been the case in the past. But they effectively detail corporate registrations and offshore tax havens. So they detail records from 14 different offshore providers, as they're called, which are accountants, law firms, facilitators who allow typically wealthy clients to move money offshore through shell companies, through offshore corporate registrations. And to some extent, they also go beyond that in some cases to tell us sort of the motivations, the thinking behind these things. So there's email correspondence, there's memos, there's bank statements, there's indications of movement of specific money or shares between trusts or corporations. And so it's a massive, obviously, task to go through all of this and then to triangulate and piece together the documents that all can move into a paper flow that allows you to track something over time. And it's a tremendous amount of work and anxiety and stress, as you can imagine. But in the end of the day, it's also tantalizing in the sense that these are records from places and systems and legal structures that are designed to not be seen and have not been seen before now. And so we are effectively gazing into what are intensely secretive documents that show movement of money that has an inherent public interest. I mean, this is exactly what the point of these things is, is people always say, well, is it illegal? Is it legal? Is it illegal? We can debate that, you know, on and on and on. And there is a giant debate on it. But what's important from a public interest point of view, from a journalistic point of view, is that there is an entire shadow economy of trillions of dollars that go around the world all the time and that people have no idea. Nobody knows. The government doesn't know. Tax officials don't know where these trillions come from and where these trillions go. And so these leaks, you know, following from the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers and now the Pandora Papers are really pulling back the curtain on this huge economy around the world that is going on and that is completely designed to never be seen until now. So let's try and quantify this a bit. Marco, what is the cost of this kind of tax evasion? So on the top level here, Canada actually has started calculating this cost. This is something that other countries have been doing for years, but only in the last three, four years has Canada now put out reports where they pour over the numbers and they're able to actually quantify how much money we the public lose to tax havens every year. And it's somewhere in the range of about $15 billion a year. 
right? It's an absolutely astronomical cost. And that's just for Canada. If you add up all around the world, it's trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars every year that disappear out of tax coffers. And, and of course, that's money that could be used for teachers or hospitals or long-term care homes or public health measures. There are lots of things that we could be spending this money on instead of just parking it in offshore accounts. So Rob, let's talk about some of these revelations. What do these papers show about the money that's hidden around the world? So there's the typical list of high profile political figures, public figures, celebrities, etc. And then there's also some really interesting previously unknown names that struck us and Canadian. And so we sort of did a broad look at those who inhabit the offshore world. And so what they show is a whole range of things, you know, and it's really interesting because the motivations in each case are different. The details of how it's done are different. And so it's a lot of forensic work trying to figure out how this all works. So some of the names that have been in the press as of yesterday are, you know, the King of Jordan, who we did a deep dive on. So this is related to a cache of luxury homes across the world from California to Washington to London that he's been purchasing over the last number of years through shell companies facilitated by a wealth manager, a Brit, but who started his career in Saskatchewan, you know, $26,000 job, fascinating kind of career trajectory from a low-level accountant in Saskatchewan in the 80s to the royal court in Jordan, assisting the king and fiercely protecting the king's identity in these transactions. In this case, the motivation was absolutely not tax evasion. The king does not pay taxes in Jordan. So this was not a case of attempting to hide transactions as a result of seeking to avoid taxes. There's a number of theories on it. The king himself, in response to us, said it was for privacy reasons. He feared terrorist threat. The addresses or the locations of these homes were to be made public. The experts we talked to had different theories, among them the scandal and public outrage that would follow from Information about the king making these lavish purchases at a time when this country is going through utter economic turmoil, protests in the streets over corruption, protests around tax evasion in that country. Meanwhile, hundreds of millions of dollars coming in from the West in aid to that country while these transactions are taking place in, you know, Oceanside mansions in Malibu. So one can imagine that that might have focused the mind in an effort to obscure those transactions and ensure that his name was not on those. We also looked at Canadians. We featured in this story in today's newspaper some Canadians ranging from Lawrence Stroll, who many of your listeners may have seen in the current Netflix series on F1. So he owns an F1 team. He's a fashion mogul, made his money in fashion, he appears amongst a star-studded lineup of billionaires in an offshore company. We feature... One of the people you profiled as being part of this is an owner of MindGeek, which is the Montreal-based parent of Pornhub, which is a company that has come under a great deal of scrutiny recently. Who is he, and what did you find out about his dealings? Yeah, it's David Tassilo. So he's become fairly prominent in the last little while. He actually appeared before a parliamentary committee several months ago investigating allegations of profiteering through publication of essentially illicit videos of people engaged in non-consexual sexual acts. He is part of the executives of that company who are named in a massive class action lawsuit in the United States. 34 women filed a class action lawsuit alleging that their images, without their knowledge and against their will, has been on Pornhub and other websites. And so we covered that story not long ago. And then in the course of doing this work, digging into this data, he appears as the sole director of four companies offshore, Anguilla, British Virgin Islands, and two in Delaware, which is sort of considered a domestic tax haven in the United States. And in each of those cases, what was interesting to us is that because we could see the actual registration, the corporate registration document, it's effectively a receipt of services that he received from the company that sets up these corporations on his behalf, he actually paid for what are called nominee shareholders and directors. So these are people that essentially take a small fee to put their name on corporations offshore in order to ensure that the actual owner, the beneficial owner, the true owner is not anywhere named. And so it's an extra degree of security and secrecy for which he paid. And of course, that made it interesting for us. And we posed that question, never did really get an answer as to why. First, he went offshore. And then secondly, he chose to mask his own name and identity on these corporations. But it's a theme 
that runs throughout these documents and previous leaks. This function, which is entirely legal, which allows effectively you or I to set up a corporation offshore, which we own, for which we are the sole owners or directors, but our names never appear. And so, you know, this goes back to sort of this question, is it legal or not legal? Well, maybe the real question to be asked is, is it right? Is it moral? Is it ethical? We'll be right back. I think, you know, we should tackle this right now. And I think one of the examples might be able to spell that out a little bit. Someone listening to this right now is probably thinking, you know, why should I care about this? I mean, if I ever became ultra rich, I'd probably want to hide some of my money in some of these things. And I think that maybe, you know, Marco, you can handle this. Elvis Stoiko was interesting. I think that that's a name obviously that would come up to some people. And he seemed to be entangled in one of these, right? Well, that's right. I mean, so here's the really interesting part, right? It is very tempting to paint with a broad brush stroke, but, you know, we should point out Elvis Stoiko, Olympian, extremely famous, accomplished Canadian figure skater. Because of the rules at the Olympics, amateur athletes aren't actually allowed to make a lot of money, right? And so Skate Canada, like Skate Canada sets up trust funds for the athletes. And it's a way of saying, look, when you get some prize money, we'll stick it in this trust. And then it's not yours technically. So you can stay under the bar and you can still remain an amateur athlete. And so Skate Canada does this for everybody. And it's seen as legitimate. When you stop being an amateur, then you can get this money later. But what did Elvis Stoiko do? He sort of took it a step further. Is He took his Skate Canada trust money and he moved it to an offshore trust in Belize where it's no longer declarable and it becomes secret. And again, it's hidden and it's offshore. And there are all sorts of questions about why someone who very publicly won this money would want to take the money offshore. And so again, it comes down to the secrecy aspect. You know, there are many people who would argue that it is totally legitimate to make, you know, any kind of arrangement that you want to make to optimize your taxes. Like if you can stick some money in a TFSA or an RESP and lower your taxes, go for it. And then I guess the question then becomes, well, sure, but you have to put your name on it and you have to tell the CRA you're doing it if you're going to reduce your taxes in a legitimate way. But when you move stuff offshore, it disappears. It goes into the ether. It's gone. It's no longer attached to you. And there's all sorts of crazy rules around technically what your lawyer says you have to tell the Canadian government you're doing and not. And so in this particular case, it's very unclear as to whether Elvis Stoiko told the CRA whether he had all this money offshore or not, or even whether he had to. You guys, in your reporting, have basically said that Canada has really become a laggard in dealing with this. Can we talk a little bit about that and maybe some of the things that might be possibly done to fix this? The number one thing we've now, Rob and I have been reporting on this since 2016, since the Panama Papers, and the number one thing that comes up time and time again is just put your name on it. Put your name on it will solve a lot of problems. And so what does that mean? That means when you start a company or a trust or a limited partnership or whatever kind of sort of bizarre arcane business structure you want to set up onshore or off, just put your name on it. The vast majority of the problems of the offshore world would be solved if we just required people to put their names on things. If you buy a house in Toronto, you got to put your name on it. If you buy a condo in Toronto, you got to put your name on it. If you open an RESP, you got to put your name on it. But as we've seen in the Panama Papers and in the Pandora Papers, you can open up an offshore company and the BVI pay someone there $100 a year to put their name on it. And then you've got plausible deniability. You say, that isn't my company. I don't know what you're talking about. Those billions don't belong to me. And so this is the reform that we see all over the world. And it really started even pre-Panama Papers, where the UK set up what they call a beneficial ownership registry. And it's anyone can go online, type in the name of a company and bang, you know who owns it. And this is seen not only from a tax point of view, this is seen just from a business point of view. You want to know who you're doing business with. If you're about to sign a contract with a company, you can look it up and say, oh, that company is legitimately owned by Rob Cribb. This guy is not trying to scam me or whatever. And so this idea of making an open registry so everyone can look up every company in the world and make sure they know who's behind it has slowly but surely been working its way around the world. It now exists in the EU It now exists in the U.S. In B.C., they set it up for property only so that now you can't register a property to a company. You got to put your name on it. And Quebec just passed legislation to make all their companies. You have to put your real ownership on the companies. And so, you know, Canada has really, we're years and years behind. Get this, in most tax havens in the world, you actually have to put your name on it now legally. But in Canada, you don't. 
So if you register a company in the Caymans, you got to put your name on it. It's not public, but somewhere in some government office, your name is on that company. In Canada, no, you can pay someone else to put their name on it. And to that point, you know, the reason that you now have to at least register your name in offshore tax havens like this is because of the journalism, right? It was the Panama Papers and a sequence of leaks that ultimately pushed this issue forward to the point where there was legislative response. There was such public outrage globally and internationally. World figures could no longer hide behind it. It was on the radar for the first time. And that has slowly made things better in these offshore jurisdictions. Comparatively, in Canada, we still lag, right? Like, so if you look at just the sheer number since the Panama Papers, which was 2016, right? So it's a good sort of period of time to judge the reaction and enforcement response to this thing. And so around the world, billions of dollars have been recovered by tax agencies, hundreds of investigations. In Canada, not one. Not one prosecution. As far as we can tell from the CRA, we don't know if there's a single dollar that's been recovered. This is frustrating. And it's not because you know, Trudeau hasn't put money in. He did. He did respond. They put lots of money into hiring auditors, etc. But the enforcement mechanisms in place in this country, perhaps the legal systems, there is likely a constellation of factors. We just cannot seem to go for big fish, get them into court, lay charges and prosecute. Guys, I'm sure there's more to come, but let's journalism nerd out a bit. This is being called the largest collaborative journalism project in history. Let's talk about that. Tell me more about how that worked. Yeah, so it was 600 reporters, I think is the last number, which like is you know inconceivable. Imagine trying to get 600 reporters to work on something for eight months without anything leaking. It's always a miracle to me that these things happen without any word sort of getting out. So we're placed under very strict secrecy. We work through encrypted communications. And there is a very fiercely protected code among those involved. And everyone has, you know, abided by it. So we all communicate through this sort of centralized online forum. Everything that we find, we're obligated to share and vice versa. If we find some, you know, a journalist at Le Mans in France or The Guardian is working on something similar, there's a sharing of information. In some cases, we actually actively collaborate. You know, one example in this particular story, this King of Jordan story, one of the main characters was this British accountant, this facilitator who we were very interested in because of his Canadian background. And we couldn't get him to respond to our questions on email. So ultimately, it was a Swiss reporter who knocked on his door in Switzerland, where he lives, and ultimately put questions to him. He still didn't answer, but nevertheless, we got confirmation from him that he was aware of the allegations that we were about to publish, and he chose not to respond to them. I mean, I almost want to say it's such a miracle that this thing works. I mean, I can't emphasize enough to listeners how this goes against every journalistic bone in your body, right? Your instinct is you find something good, you want to like hold on to it and keep it for yourself, get that scoop. And, you know, in a world where like dwindling resources in media are widespread, you know, every media organization is struggling financially around the world, this kind of collaboration is almost like breathed new life into, and it's a total change of the way we operate. It used to be, you know, this cutthroat competition, like get something and hold it back until you get it all and then blow away the competition. And here we are, you know, chatting in French with the reporters at Le Monde and speaking to guys in Japan and Jordan and all across the Middle East and coordinating, you know, and it brings this richness to the reporting that we could never have done on our own because you get that real local perspective. You know, if you have a question about something that's going on in Jordan, the reporter in Jordan will tell you, oh, no, 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 no. Let me explain to you. This is how things work over here. And so we just get this ability to kind of be on the ground in places that we're not in the ground. And that adds like a level of sophistication and local context that we could never have done on our own. Gentlemen, it's fascinating, it's a fascinating story. I'm sure it will have incredible ramifications and we will be following along. I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thanks. Thanks, Raji. Robert Cribb and Marco Oved are investigative reporters at The Star. On a final note, the following people were discussed in this episode and when reached for comment, provided these statements. David Tessio wrote a statement saying that the offshore structure the star asked about was, quote, the first and only I've ever set up on behalf of MindGeek, and the transactions and structure were entirely appropriate. Elvis Toiko told the CBC, a Pandora Papers partner, he set up a trust on the advice of his longtime lawyer and that it was closed in 2012. Lauren Stroll's personal financial advisor, Jonathan Dudman, responded to the star saying that Superwit Profits was a small business originated by Stroll's friend, David Tang, in 1998. 
and the King of Jordan's lawyers, in a written correspondent, said there is nothing improper in the King's ownership of properties through offshore companies and that he has not misused public money or aid. That's it for today. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm your host, Raju Mudder. Our This Matters team is Adrian Chung, Brian Bradley, JP Fozo, Matt Hearn, Morgan Bockneck, Saba Etizaz, and Sean Pattenden. Our music is by so-called Mike DeAngelis and Sean Pattenden. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com slash subscribing matters. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon.